Lecture 5, Prayer. Let us begin with a reading from 400 Texts on Love by Maximus the Confessor. Just as soul and body combine to produce a human being, so practice of the virtues and contemplation together constitute a unique spiritual wisdom and the Old and New Testaments together form a single mystery. A listening presence in the process of spiritual direction leads us to, to yet another important mooring, the need for prayer. If you are a theologian, you will pray truly. And if you pray truly, you are a theologian. These words of Evagrius Ponticus, who lived in the late fourth century, remind us of the intimate connection between conversing with and understanding the mystery of the divine. Now we are not talking about a mere knowledge about God. A true knowledge of God involves an experience of the divine mystery. And such experiential knowledge comes not through a rational analysis, but from a living relationship with God, nourished by prayer. This understanding of theology emphasizes the importance of knowing God by participating in the intimate community of divine love. It emphasizes the living reality of God, living reality of God over our theological constructions of him. That reality is closer to us than we are to ourselves. We tap into it by being present to it and by allowing it to be present to us. And in this lecture, we will see how spiritual direction helps us to get in touch with this deep spiritual reality. The theologian for Evagrius is one who knows how to pray in truth. Jesus Christ, the Gospel of John tells us, is the way, the truth, and the life. This means that when we pray, we are seeking to follow the way of Jesus, to live life by adopting his attitude of mind, his outlook on life and reality, so that we can pray in truth, by taking off the false masks that we wear before God and one another, and by praying to God, talking to God, allowing him to see us as we truly are. And this gives us life. The glory of God, as St. Irenaeus tells us, is the human person fully alive. To be fully alive with the love of God is what it means to give glory to God. So we pray in the truth about ourselves, and we pray in the truth about God, holding nothing back. Coming to this intimate knowledge of ourselves is no easy task. Most of us cannot go it alone and are in need of dire help. And that is why we need spiritual direction we find facing our inner wants and insecurities much too threatening. Left to our own resources, many of us would end up rationalizing away our fears and discounting our deepest hopes about who we are and who we are called to become. We are afraid to examine our deepest thoughts and feelings out of fear of what we might find there and what we may be challenged to do. And so we put off until tomorrow, what needs to be done today, spiritual direction seeks to remedy this situation. It provides us with help, the help we need to confront ourselves and open our hearts to God. 
It does so by gently helping us to recognize and then listen to the voice of the Spirit manifested in the nitty-gritty circumstances of our lives. And more often than not, that voice, as the experience of the prophet Elijah reminds us, is found not in the tumultuous whirlwinds, earthquakes, and fires about us, but from the still, small, whispering sound that can only be heard in the solitude of our hearts. Look at 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 11 through 13. Spiritual direction seeks to settle our hearts so that we can rest in the solitude and become ourselves in our faith. And as a helping relationship between two people, it focuses on our conscious and unconscious interaction with the divine. It helps us to sift through the conflicting, often troublesome, personal narratives vying for our attention so that we can make responsible judgments about where we have come from and what we are, go are being called to become. It pays special heed to our life of prayer, helping us to discern the true self from the false self and authentic prayer from its mean and paltry imitation. The ultimate goal of spiritual direction is to help us pray in truth, and in doing so, we become ourselves in our faith. To do so, it seeks to empower us to confront ourselves so that we can eventually discover our authentic voice. And that voice alone will lead us to intimacy with the divine. To find it, however, we must be patient, we must be still, we must be ever so silent, we must listen to our hearts, and we soon find that when we do that, we discover the gentle voice of the Spirit yearning within us, crying out, Abba, Father. Just read Romans 8, 15. To pray in truth is to pray in the Spirit the recreative presence of God that hovers over and revives the primal forces within us. We know we are praying in the Spirit when our lives manifest the various gifts and fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are its fruits which flow from the gifts, wisdom, understanding, counsel, knowledge, fortitude, piety, fear of the Lord. I will have something more to say about these various fruits and gifts in a later lecture. Spiritual direction helps us to identify these spiritual riches and allow them to do their quiet work within us. And that work concerns an ongoing and gradual process of divinization that draws us into deeper participation in the eternal celebration of love within the Godhead. So to pray in truth requires solitude of heart, the primary means by which the Spirit accomplishes its task in us is by nurturing within us a deep desire and yearning for solitude, by helping us to empty our hearts of unnecessary attachments. It enables us to make room for the divine indwelling. Solitude of heart is the precondition for our experience of the fullness of life. As I said, quoting St. Irenaeus, the glory of God is the human person fully alive. We who are created in the image and likeness of God becomes ourselves only by allowing God to become himself in us. Spiritual direction helps, seeks to help people open their hearts to the heart of God. It does so 
by helping them to foster a contemplative attitude towards life that enables them to see all that happens in the light of God's providential plan. So spiritual directors can play an essential role in this process. They do so by offering those seeking guidance the hospitality of a listening heart. We set the tone for all that happens during the procession by being present to those who come to us in silence and with our full attention. This affirms the seriousness of what is taking place and often develops into a lasting bond of friendship. This bond springs from our reflective gaze upon the person's unfolding experience and results in a shared experience of solitude. One of the goals of the direction process is for the director and those seeking guidance to gradually turn their attention to the presence of this silent third partner in their midst, the Holy Spirit. And they do so by discerning the signs of the Spirit in the narrative of life that those seeking guidance share with their director. And the deepest sign, when you know that God is speaking to you, is that you have a deep sense of peace about where you have come from and where you are going and what you need to do. If a theologian is the person who prays in truth, then spiritual direction concerns the process that allows such prayer to shape, to take shape in a person's life. Theology, as the learned editors of the Philokalia tell us, denotes far more than learning about God and religious doctrine acquired through academic study. It signifies active and conscious participation in or perception of the realities of the divine world. In other words, the realization of spiritual knowledge, spiritual wisdom. All of us are called to reflect upon the meaning of our lives in the light of this gospel narrative. Spiritual direction helps us pray in truth. Spiritual direction achieves this goal through an honest, sharing relationship between two persons. It involves active listening, an active listening which is ready to challenge at times and also ready to console and to know when to do either. In the final analysis, the process of faith-seeking understanding is spiritual, in spiritual direction requires flexibility and strength, the ability to adapt to changing times and circumstances, the capacity to withstand whatever adverse challenges may come to the fore. And in doing so, we walk the way of holiness. Becoming ourselves in the faith is but another way of speaking about our desire for holiness. Spiritual direction is not simply a matter of helping us gain greater insight into our relationship with God. It has very much to do with turning those insights into concrete practices that will help us to walk further along the path of conversion. So we move from insight to concrete practices to a realistic assessment of our lives, and then a sense of what we need to do to walk and carry our cross, follow the way of Christ, and to walk upon the way of holiness. Being is intimately related to action. Action flows from being, and action informs, in turn, shapes the type of people we are. So let us conclude. Spiritual direction helps us to understand the practice of the nature of true prayer. The goal of spiritual direction is to draw us closer to God so we can share in the full benefits of what it means to live in the Spirit. And let us conclude with some reflection questions. 
Is it possible to direct someone who may be farther along the path of holiness than you? What are some of the dangers to expect when directing someone who has advanced far in his or her relationship with God? What negative signs should you look for that would indicate that something has gone awry? What can you do to make sure this person continues along the path of holiness? Would there ever come a time when you might suggest that he or she seek another director?